Reading from 1 Peter 2, 2 through 5, and verse 10. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to you. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, so that by it you may grow into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. Come to him, a living stone, though rejected by mortals, yet chosen and precious in God's sight. And like living stones, let yourselves be built up into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Gentle Spirit, call out to us, give us life, comfort us, journey with us. Help us to always recognize your presence around us. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be pleasing to you and acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. 
Amen. Mother's Day started in the early part of the 20th century. Maybe some of you know the history behind this holiday. There was a woman, Anna, who had a mother named Anne, who had just died, and it was at her memorial service. Her mom, Anne, had lived through the American Civil War, and she was a committed pacifist. She was so committed to the idea of peace that in the Civil War she treated wounded soldiers no matter which side of the battle lines they had been on. After the war was over, she started Mother's Day work clubs where she advocated for public health reform. Did you know this? And Anna, the daughter, when her mother died, wanted a way to remember her mother's life and work her work for peace, her work for health reform. And so, she began lobbying in Congress, hoping that one day there might be a Mother's Day. She went saying, who's done more for you than your mother who gave you life? But Congress said, uh, we can't have a National Mother's Day because before long we'll have to have a mother-in-law day. And they didn't want to do that. But by 1911, it was a national holiday. Now, I don't know about you, but Mother's Day growing up was one of the high holy days in the church. <laughs> what I mean by that is there were typically more people in attendance on Mother's Day because the mothers and grandmothers made their children and grandchildren feel guilty if they weren't there. <laughs> it was also a day where you saw fancier dresses with hats and gloves. You saw suits and ties. And of course, any mothers in your life had corsages that wouldn't clash with the carnations that the church would be giving you later in the service. Did any of you grow up celebrating Mother's Day like this? I see a few hands out there. Yes, yes. Although it was a high holy day in the church of my youth, since that time I've tended not to talk too much about Mother's Day. I realize that for some folks it is a joyful day. It's a day where uh, if you have a good relationship with your, your mother or your grandmother or aunts, it can be a day to celebrate that relationship. Even if you have a mother figure in your life, it can be a good day to celebrate that. Or if you are a mother, particularly perhaps if you're a new mother, it can be a day where you feel like finally you're getting some recognition. At least my wife has told me that a lot of times you feel like you are defined by your child and there's a day where you are... Uh, granted a little bit of respect for what you do. On the other hand, it can also be a painful day for some, a day of, of loss, a day where you remember broken relationships or think about what might have been or what might never be. And what do we say about families that aren't traditional families? I mean, what about LGBT families? And what about uh, adoptive families? And what about families where children are raised by other members of the family or friends of the family? It's a joyful day for some, a painful day for others. And so typically what I do is mention Mother's Day and move right along to try and have a little bit of a balance, which is probably what I would do today, except that I was struck by today's scripture reading that Allison read so wonderfully just a moment ago. The scripture reading is from the book of First Peter, which is a book that we don't read from very often. In fact, I don't think I've ever preached a sermon on First Peter before. First Peter is one of the few epistles in the New Testament not attributed to Paul. It's attributed, of course, to Jesus' disciple Peter, but probably wasn't written by him. We know that in part because Peter was a fisherman and probably illiterate, and this was written in eloquent Greek. So probably not Peter. But the imagery is beautiful. He says, Christians ought to be like a newborn who turned to their mother for milk saying that Christians ought to turn to God for spiritual nourishment like infants turn to their mother. A striking image of the closeness between a Christian and God. You know, we don't often 
talk about feminine images of God, do we? I mean, a lot of Christendom is perfectly comfortable calling God the Father, but if we call God a mother, a lot of times that falls uh, difficult on our ears. It's, it's different. We don't hear that a lot. But did you know there are a great deal of feminine images for God in the Bible? In fact, Pastor Don Hutchings says that even some of our translations miss the feminine roots of the words. For example, uh, the term El Shaddai, which is often translated as God Almighty, can be translated as she with breasts. But you can understand why King James' version of the Bible didn't translate it in that way. But, th but that's a possible translation of that. Did you know that Elohim, a word used for for God throughout the Hebrew Bible is the feminine plural of the Hebrew word majesty? Did you know that the Hebrew word for spirit is feminine? And that the word for wisdom in Hebrew and Greek, the Greek is Sophia, is feminine? God's wisdom personified is a woman. I think that's a powerful image. Did you know that there are a number of feminine images for God throughout the Bible, other than just the terms that we use? God's referred to as a mother eagle, a mother hen, a pregnant woman, a woman in labor, a nursing mother, a mother comforting her child, even a woman searching for a lost coin. Feminine images of God abound, which tells me that the authors of the Bible didn't have any problem using feminine language for God and didn't have any problem using these images, thinking about God in feminine terms or in maternal terms. Now, I'm not usually one who advocates gendering God in any way. I think that our human binary uh, gender language often isn't helpful. Thank goodness we're finally starting to break free from some of that uh, binary gender thought in our lives. But still, we tend to talk about God if we're using a gender binary to, to talk about God as a father. But I think that sometimes gendering God uh, can be helpful. Let me give you an example. In the Gospels, Jesus refers to God as Abba, Father, right? We know that the closest English word to that is Daddy. That's, that's something that's kind of hard to hear. We often tend to think about God as kind of distant from us. But this word that Jesus uses, Abba, connotes something different. It connotes a, a deep personal closeness, intimacy, and it's helpful to have that word because we get an understanding in how Jesus understood God. And the same is true in thinking about God and the feminine. Let me give you an example that maybe you haven't heard before. Remember in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, be merciful as God is merciful. Do you remember this verse? Be merciful as God is merciful. Scholar Marcus Borg suggests that perhaps a better way to translate that is to be compassionate as God is compassionate. He said that's a truer translation to the original roots of that phrase. But regardless of how you translate it, he says if you look to the Hebrew roots of the word that's translated either as mercy or compassion. The singular form of that word is womb. Did you know this? The singular of that word, which we translate as mercy or compassion, is womb. This is something that's lost in translation, obviously. And so when Jesus is telling us to be compassionate as God is compassionate, he's telling us to be womb-like. Now what does that mean? That's not even a word, womb-like. Well, Borg suggests that whenever a woman is pregnant, all of a sudden she is responsible for this whole other being. And everything that she eats, everything that she drinks, everything that she does affects this other being, whether she wants it to or not. They are sharing the same body 
They are intimately connected. Being womb-like means that God cares for us like that, as if we were a child in the womb. And so you see, when Jesus says to be compassionate as God is compassionate, he's saying to view others in the same way, as if everything that we do affects them. That's pretty radical, isn't it? A wonderfully compassionate and radical response. Obviously something that is missed in translation because we don't have the word womb-like in our language. Be compassionate as God is compassionate. Not an image I want to lose. So today, no matter where you find yourself, if you find yourself having a joyful day or if this day is painful for you, no matter what this day is like for you, I hope you can look to God as a mothering God. A God who gave you birth, a God who walks with you on your journey, who calls out to you and comforts you. May your mother and God be with you this day and always. Amen.